How did a 1,400-pound engine, built like a tank, turn into a headache for the very truckers it was designed for? On paper, the International Harvester DT-466 seemed perfect. A beefy cast-iron block, wet sleeve design, and more power and reliability than its competitors. It could even be rebuilt in chassis, saving time and money. An engine designed for hard work in a market shifting to diesels. So what went wrong? The real reasons had more to do with how it was built and the choices IH made behind closed doors. Decisions about marketing, product strategy, and how far they were willing to push the design. This is the story of the DT-466, a powerhouse that didn't always live up to the promise. The International Harvester DT-466 wasn't just another engine. When it first rolled out in the early 1970s, it wasn't even aimed at trucks. The DT-466 was born from the same family as the DT-414 and DT-436, part of IH's 400 series engine lineup, which shared a 4.3-inch bore but varied in stroke and displacement. While the DT-414 and DT-436 found homes in row crop tractors like the 1066 and 1466, the DT-466, with its longer 5.35-inch stroke, was originally intended for construction equipment, big machines that needed torque and endurance. That changed quickly. After a $500,000 tooling investment, International pivoted to offer the DT-466 in trucks. Starting in 1975, it became an option in the Fleetstar, Cargostar, Paystar, and Lodestar lines. For a market that was rapidly shifting toward diesel engines, the DT-466 looked like the perfect fit. The competition was heating up, with Cat, Cummins, Detroit Diesel, and Perkins all battling for a piece of the medium-duty market. International's pitch was simple more power, better fuel economy, and longer life than what was currently on the road. The DT-466's engineering gave it an edge, at least on paper. The cast iron deep skirt block was built to take a beating, weighing in at nearly 400 pounds just for the crankcase alone. It featured seven massive main bearings, a 150-pound forged steel crankshaft with induction-hardened journals, and beefy connecting rods that could handle far more stress than the engine was ever rated for in stock form. While the factory ratings ranged from around 160 to 230 horsepower, sometimes feeling underwhelming for the engine's size, those same components could support much higher power levels in modified setups like in tractor pulls where some engines have been pushed beyond 1,000 horsepower. But for most truckers, it wasn't the potential that mattered, it was what the engine actually delivered out on the road. The wet sleeve cylinder design was a standout feature. While most medium duty engines of the era used parent bore construction, where the cylinders were integral to the block, the DT-466's wet sleeves were removable and replaceable. This meant operators could rebuild an engine in frame without pulling it from the chassis, a major time and cost saver for fleet operators. The liners were made from ductile iron, a material choice that offered both durability and better heat transfer allowing the engine to handle sustained heavy loads without warping. The fuel system in early DT-466 models was a mechanical setup using the AMBAC Model 100 rotary injection pump. Later variants, like the DT-466C and DT-466P, moved to inline Bosch pumps like the P7100, which allowed for higher fueling rates and better performance. This progression gave the engine more flexibility for tuning, but it also created variation in reliability and parts compatibility across generations. International strategy wasn't just about building a tough engine, it was about selling the idea of a one-size-fits-all solution. The DT-466 could power farm equipment, dump trucks, school buses, and box trucks. It was an engine that could do it all, or at least that was the promise. And for a while it seemed to deliver. Fleet managers liked the idea of simplifying parts inventories and maintenance procedures, 
While drivers appreciated the straightforward mechanical design and the potential for in-chassis rebuilds. But this approach also had its limits. The DT-466 was heavy, hundreds of pounds heavier than its competition in some cases, and it didn't chase big horsepower numbers. It was a workhorse, not a racehorse. That trade-off would become a sticking point for some users, especially as emissions regulations pushed the engine into more complex territory in later years. For many buyers, though, the DT-466 seemed like the perfect solution, a tough, reliable engine that could handle hard work and keep trucks moving. But, as time would prove, what looked good on paper didn't always translate into satisfaction on the road. DT-466 promised durability and power, but for many drivers, it didn't feel like they got what they signed up for. Since the engine was heavier than nearly any other in its class, that weight came at a cost – lower payload capacity. In a business where every pound counts carrying less freight meant lower profits, and operators running lighter engines from Cummins or Detroit often had an advantage. Beyond the weight, the engine's performance left some drivers unimpressed. It could pull, but it didn't always pull strong. On steep grades or when trying to get up to speed, many trucks with a DT-466 felt sluggish. The power was there on paper, but it didn't always translate into real-world performance, especially when loaded heavy or under pressure to keep up with traffic. It was marketed as a do-it-all engine. But that versatility wasn't always a good thing. An engine that worked fine in a school bus might feel out of place in a medium-duty freight hauler? The broad market fit sometimes led to mismatches between the engine's capabilities and what drivers really needed. Later models, especially the electronic versions introduced in the mid-90s, came with more complexity than many drivers wanted. The new electronic fuel injection system, known as HEUI, was supposed to make the engine more efficient and meet emission standards. But in practice, it often made the engine less predictable. Hard starts, stalling, and electrical gremlins became familiar headaches, frustrating drivers who just wanted an engine they could count on. For all its strengths, the DT-466 often left drivers wanting more. The DT-466's heavy build wasn't just a spec sheet stat. It created real-world problems that truckers couldn't ignore. As mentioned earlier, the engine weighed more than competitors like Cummins in Detroit, but it wasn't just a matter of losing payload. That weight put extra stress on other truck components. Front axles, suspensions, and brakes all had to work harder, wearing out faster and costing owners more in maintenance. And while the engine's cast iron block and forged internals were built for strength, they didn't always prevent failures. Early versions, especially the 400 series engines, had issues with camshaft wear. Some drivers reported lobe failures leading to misfires or loss of power, problems that could sideline a truck for days. Head gasket problems were another issue that kept popping up. The DT-466's massive cylinder head, weighing in at over 250 pounds, was bolted down with six head bolts per cylinder. But the OEM head bolts were a known weak point. While they were fine at factory power levels, once boost and fueling were turned up, even modestly, they had a tendency to stretch leading to blown head gaskets and coolant leaks. Some operators figured out that replacing the bolts with stronger aftermarket studs could solve the problem, but not everyone had the knowledge or budget for that fix. The transition to electronic controls in the mid-90s added a whole new layer of headaches. The HEUI system developed with Caterpillar was supposed to modernize the engine, but it ended up being one of the biggest sources of frustration. Injectors were known for failing, sometimes catastrophically, and the high-pressure oil system that powered them was finicky, prone to leaks, pressure loss, and failures that were tough to diagnose without specialized tools. What used to be a straightforward in-chassis rebuild became a guessing game of chasing electrical issues, replacing sensors, and hoping the problem didn't come back a week later. Oil leaks were another common complaint. The DT-466's external oil cooler design was a known trouble spot, with seals that could fail and dump oil at the worst times. Combine that with a tendency for rear main seals to leak, especially on higher mileage engines, and you had a recipe for messy, expensive repairs. Then there was the turbo. 
While the engine was turbocharged from the factory, the stock turbo wasn't exactly known for longevity. Many drivers reported premature failures, often traced back to oil starvation or contamination. And if a trucker broke down on the road, getting help wasn't always easy. While IH had a dealer network, it wasn't as widespread or parts-rich as competitors like Cummins or CAT. For fleets running a mixed lineup, waiting on parts or dealing with a less established service network sometimes meant extra downtime. The reality was, while the DT-466 had a reputation for being tough, it came with its share of quirks and recurring issues. For fleet owners and drivers who needed a reliable, low-maintenance workhorse, those problems added up to downtime, lost loads, and frustration that no spec sheet could explain away. International Harvester had a solid foundation with the DT-466. They had the block, they had the crank, they had the wet sleeves. But what they didn't have was a willingness to lean into what made the engine truly valuable to truckers, or to adapt fast enough when things changed. For starters, they could have focused on keeping the engine simple. The mechanical models were reliable because they were basic. Drivers could work on them. Shops didn't need proprietary tools. If something broke, you could usually figure it out without a laptop. When IH introduced the HEUI system, they complicated what had been a straightforward, dependable engine. Sure, emissions rules forced their hand, but IH could have followed the lead of Cummins, who managed to keep their mechanical systems running longer, or Detroit Diesel, who phased in electronics more gradually. Instead, IH went all in on a technology that just wasn't mature yet, and truckers paid the price. IH also missed the mark by not offering higher horsepower options earlier in the engine's life. The DT-466 had the bones to handle more power, but IH stuck with conservative ratings, probably to protect engine life and avoid warranty claims. The problem was, competitors like Cummins and Cat were already pushing bigger numbers. Truckers hauling heavier loads, especially in hilly terrain, wanted that extra power, and many felt forced to look elsewhere to get it. The headbolt issue was another problem IH should have addressed. When you're building an engine with a 250-pound cylinder head and asking it to hold boost under load, six head bolts per cylinder wasn't enough, at least not with the hardware IH was using. They could have upgraded to stronger fasteners or increased clamping force to reduce head gasket failures. But instead, they left it to the aftermarket to solve, and that left a lot of operators holding the bag when things went wrong. Another big miss was the turbocharger setup. The stock turbo on the DT-466 was a known weak point, especially as emissions regulations tightened and exhaust gas temperatures crept higher. IH could have invested in a more robust turbo design one with better oiling, stronger bearings, or a higher flow capacity, to give the engine more breathing room. Instead, they stuck with a basic unit that often failed early, leaving drivers with costly repairs and unexpected downtime. The external oil cooler was another design flaw that IH never properly addressed. That cooler was a common source of leaks, and replacing it wasn't exactly a quick or easy job. A redesign could have sealed up that weak spot, saving owners countless hours of downtime and mess. IH also could have done more to listen to the truckers who ran these engines every day. Drivers wanted an engine that could pull harder, last longer without leaks, and keep running without an electrical degree. IH had the engineering chops to deliver that, but they didn't. They pushed the DT-466 across too many platforms without tailoring it to specific use cases. A school bus doesn't need the same power curve as a dump truck, and a box truck doesn't need the same torque as a grain hauler. IH could have offered more specialized tuning or even optional packages to better match the engine to the truck. And let's not forget the bigger picture. IH had a chance to build on the DT-466's reputation by expanding the lineup. Drivers wondered why there wasn't a larger displacement version that could handle more demanding applications. But they stuck to one size fits all, and when they tried to evolve the platform with the Max Force engines, it only got worse. More emissions, more complexity, more problems.